Hello and welcome to our introduction to complex numbers. Now, just to provide a little motivation for complex numbers, let's just say that we have an nth order polynomial, or just a polynomial of the form constant a n times x raised to the nth power plus a n minus 1 times x raised to the n minus 1 power all the way down to a to the 1 times x, or x to the first power, plus a naught times, as you could think of, 1 or x to the 0 power, is equal to 0. Now, in general, for an nth order polynomial, it's going to have n roots, or n solutions. And we can typically denote these solutions as x1, x2, all the way up to xn. Now let's just take a bit of a deeper look at this. Now let's just look at the case where n is equal to 1. This will give us what we like to call linear equations. For example, x minus 3 is equal to 0 is a linear equation. And since n is equal to 1, it's going to have one solution, and the solution is fairly obvious, just x is equal to 3. Now let's take a look at the case where an n is equal to 2. These give us what we like to call quadratic equations. An example of a quadratic equation is x squared plus 4x plus 3 is equal to 0. Now, one way you can solve quadratic equations is with the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula says that if you have a quadratic equation in standard form, which is just something of the form constant a times x squared, plus a constant b times x, plus a constant c is equal to zero. Then you can use the quadratic formula, which says that the two solutions are going to be x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four times a times c, all under two a. And we're going to say that this gives us two solutions because one solution is going to use the plus sign and one solution is going to use the minus sign. And hopefully with this, or maybe even without this, you can recognize that the two solutions for this example are x is equal to negative 3 and x is equal to negative 1. It should all hopefully be review. Now the quadratic formula can help us solve a lot of quadratic equations, but eventually we're going to reach an interesting stumbling block. Let's just say that we have this equation here, x squared plus 1 is equal to 0. Now you may say, I don't even need the quadratic equation. I'm just, I can find x just by isolating it. So I'm going to subtract uh, 1 on both sides and take the square root. And we're going to get that x is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 1. Now we don't know how to take the square root of a negative number. In fact, mathematics doesn't really know how to properly take the square root of a negative number. And let's just, like, really look at this. Just as a brief refresher, let's take a look at squares and square roots. When we say that a number is squared, we essentially multiply that number by itself. So, 4 squared, that's just 4 times 4, which is just 16. And we can do this with negative numbers, so negative 4 squared, that's just negative 4 times negative 4, and negative times negative is, uh, is a positive, we cancel out, so we're again left with positive 16. On just a brief aside, um, the squared function is what we like to call a 2 to 1 function. It takes two different inputs and can map them to the same output. But, proceeding on, uh, the square root is the inverse of this. Essentially, if we have the square root of a number, we need to try and find a number that, when multiplied by itself, will give us this number that we're interested in. Now, if we take the square root of 16, we know that 4 squared will give us 16, and we know that negative 4 squared will give us 16. So we say that the square root of 16 is plus or minus 4. And again, just a brief aside, uh, 
The square root function is what we like to call a one to two function. It can take one input and map it to two different outputs. But carrying on, what would happen if we had the square root of a negative number? Now, we know a positive times itself is just going to be positive. A negative number times itself is also going to be positive. So no number, when multiplied by itself, is going to give a negative answer. So this is, we like to say, has no real solution. But we can use a bit of a trick. We can define what they like to call the imaginary unit. And we're going to denote this imaginary unit as I. Or, in some engineering classes, they like to call it J. But we're going to stick with I. And I is defined as I squared is equal to negative 1. And you might see it as positive I is defined as equal to the positive square root of negative 1. So we can use this imaginary unit to work with these two problems we've been dealing with. In which case, if we use that i is equal to the square root of negative 1, we see that the two roots of this quadratic equation are just x is equal to plus i and x is equal to minus i. And using this imaginary notation, we can say that the square root of negative 16, that's just i times the square root of 16, which is just plus or minus 4i. Now when we start dealing with this imaginary unit, we're going to have to start classifying numbers. So one class is what we like to call real numbers. These are numbers that don't have any of these imaginary unit terms. So zero is a real number, three is a real number, negative four thirds is a real number, radical two is a real number, pi is a real number. They all don't have this i term. Now, we can also define imaginary numbers. Imaginary. These are numbers that are multiplied by this imaginary unit. So, plus or minus 4i is imaginary. Now, let's say 7 fourths is imaginary, etc. They all have this i term. Now, the most general case of numbers is what we like to call complex numbers complex numbers. Now a complex number, z, let's say, has the general form that's going to be equal to a plus b i, where a and b are constants. Now before we do any math with complex numbers, I just really want to point out four important ideas. The first is that since a and b are just constants, they can be equal to zero, in which case let's just say that b is equal to zero we're just left with the real number a. And if a is equal to zero, we're left with b i, and we're left with imaginary numbers. So complex numbers includes all real numbers, it includes all imaginary numbers, and it includes the sum of real and imaginary numbers. The next thing to note is that complex numbers have a real number and an imaginary number, but they also have what we like to call a real part and an imaginary part. Now, the real part of this complex number in this form is just going to be this number a. This is our real part, and our real part is also a real number. Now, here's the important thing. The imaginary part of this complex number, the form a plus bi, is just the b term. This is our imaginary part. Now it's important to point out that the imaginary part is just the b. It's not b times i. The imaginary part does not include the i term. So you could say that since it doesn't have the i term, the imaginary part of a complex number is real. It's an important thing to keep in mind. The third thing is when you do algebra with complex numbers, you have to treat it as you would a polynomial, with, which means that we can add two complex numbers together. So we can add a plus bi to, let's say, 
C plus DI. And the way we do this is we add the real parts and the imaginary parts independently. So we can add the reals together and get A plus C plus, and add the imaginary parts together and get B plus D times I. We can also multiply two complex numbers, so we can multiply A plus BI times C plus DI, and we would factor this out like we would polynomials, so, sorry, should I should say distribute this out, so this is equal to A times C plus, uh, let's see, A times DI plus C times BI plus bi times di, which is just bd times i squared. Now, i squared, that's negative 1, which means that this bd term is real. So we can simplify this by grouping the real parts and the imaginary parts. So this is equal to ac minus, we have the minus sign from here, bd plus a, D, plus B, C, times I. Now the last thing I want to point out with complex numbers is that if we have a complex number Z, which is equal to A plus B, I, there's an interesting concept called the complex conjugate, which we can call Z bar, or as I, like, or as I prefer it, Z star, and that's defined as a minus bi. It has the same real part, it has the same imaginary part, but just with the sign flipped. And the reason why we're interested with complex conjugates is an interesting thing happens when you multiply a complex number by its conjugate. So if you multiply z by z star, that's the same as a plus bi times a minus bi. Now we can distribute this out. We're going to get that. That's equal to a squared uh, plus a b i minus a b i minus b squared i squared. And this i squared, that's negative 1. The positive a b i will cancel with the negative a b i. And this negative 1 term that we're multiplying here will cancel with the negative term here. So you can say that that's both plus positive, and we're left with just a squared plus b squared. Now the reason why this is interesting is that our original numbers, z and z star, those were both complex numbers. They both had i terms. But when we multiply a number by its conjugate, we're always left with a real answer. The i's term will always cancel. Now, keeping those things in mind, let's proceed into the next video.